Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is United States Army Lieutenant Colonel Brian Burbank, who is currently assigned as the Ghost Team Chief within the Operations Group at the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, California. The Ghost Team is comprised of key enablers to support information advantage, specifically civil affairs, cyber electromagnetic activities, public affairs, psychological operations, and space operations. Brian Burbank, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thanks, John. It's great to be here. And uh, I'd just like to mention to our audience that Brian's views are his own and do not represent the views of the United States Army or any other government agency. Uh, so the conversation I'd like to have with you today, Brian, will cover transparent battlefield concepts and multi-domain operations. But before we get into these topics, could we start by getting your assessment of our strategic landscape? Oh, great question. So first of all, uh, I think we have to be stewards and, and look at the second uh, um, Nagarno or Karabat war. It, there's a lot of lessons to be learned out of, uh, out of that, that war. Um, most importantly, uh, we'll talk about this throughout the, the podcast, but, you know, we are currently under a uh, transparent battlefield. Uh, the new Army Doctrine, FM 3O, talks about accounting for being under constant observation in all forms of enemy contact at, at any given time. It, so it's, it's really interesting to watch the war in Ukraine play out, both, both you know, professionally uh, and you know, personally, because you just watch what, what's going on in, in the world today. Like the satellite imagery that we saw early on in the war, you know, coming in from uh, uh, going towards Kiev, that, that 40 mile logistic convoy that just broke down uh, and uh, that whole trail of tears, that imagery was all Maxar commercial satellite imagery. That imagery would have been top secret easily five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, and that's commercially available to anyone with enough, uh, with a big enough wallet to, to account for that. We, we've seen uh, the electromagnetic uh, spectrum in the Ukraine has been a huge deal. Um, electronic warfare really is, is playing out in real time, and uh, there's quite a bit of uh, GPS interference in there. So that's those are lessons that we have to take back, uh, the United States Army. And UAVs, like uh, everything from quadcopters, you know, the small Group One uh, UAVs, all the way up to the larger ones like the Global Hawk. Uh, those are the between satellite imagery and UAVs. Those are the first forms of contact that our, our troops are going to encounter uh, on the future battlefield, uh, well before they even see an actual person on the other side. They're going to be under constant observation at, at all times, uh, and that's going to help enable long-range precision fires uh, and and be attriting our forces before we get a chance to fire our direct weapon systems. Uh, we're not going to be able to hide on uh, on the modern battlefield anymore. We're going to have to take advantage of some of the some of the lessons we learned out of the the Cold War with train masking and dispersion and all that stuff uh we we've got to be able to uh, increase the decision uh matrix of our adversary when they're looking at targets to shoot at we've got to look less important right now i feel like our uh, c2 nodes or uh, those command and control points those tactical operation centers they're uh, they're not currently survivable in the way that they are um so we're going to have to change fundamentally as, as an army uh, as, as we move forward. So a lot of interesting stuff going on. 
it, it's a it's a really interesting time to be a military professional and studying you know uh, what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, uh, and, and the potential for miscalculations is high. So, uh, it yeah, absolutely, it's it's an interesting time to be a military professional. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a there's a Chinese proverb. I, I'm not sure whether it's intended to be interpreted favorably or uh, unfavorably, but it's something like, may you live in interesting times. And I, I think that that certainly fits, uh, especially given everything that you were just recapping. Uh, no, no shortage of problems or challenges, uh, for sure. Uh, do you think perhaps you could give our audience just a little bit more background about your career? Yeah, so uh, I've been an information operations officer since uh, uh, 2013. Uh, I've got two deployments as an information operations officer, one to a joint task force in Afghanistan uh, when I was with the, the first in information operations battalion at Fort Belvoir, um, second when I was at uh, third corps at Fort Hood, Texas, I went to combine joint task force operation here at Resolve uh, in Kuwait for just over a year. And I got back 15 months ago from that deployment. Um, so, you know, looking at Syria and Iraq and, and the problems that we have, and also some of the proxy uh, conflicts that we have between, you know, it's great power competition at its finest inside of Syria, with Russia, Syria, uh, Iran, uh, all the different religious factions. It's uh, it, it was a professionally rewarding deployment i'll say that yeah yeah for sure uh, so maybe we could start talking a little bit more about um, the ghost team and where you work so what does the army do at the national training center and what is the role of the ghost team it, it, is there any kind of a story behind that that name it's uh it there's there's got to be right oh absolutely so we take our heritage from the Headquarters 23rd Special Troops, uh, which from World War II was patent ghost army. Uh, so they're the ones that were running around with inflatable tanks, uh, doing sonic deception or loudspeakers uh, on vehicles to make it sound like uh, there was a larger footprint. And uh, they would go do ruses. They would go into a town where they knew there were German sympathizers and wear different patches and talk about you know, logistics and how all these troops were coming in. And there were certain times where, uh, you know, they deceived their, their fellow, fellow peers where they thought there was actually more tanks in the area. You know, a tank battalion thought they, there was actual tanks to their, to their flank uh, and didn't realize that it was all just a ruse. So uh, as Ghost Team was stood up in the, in the, the fall of 2020, uh, we thought it was uh, fitting to, uh, to reflect back on the heritage. So we have the ghost with the, the lightning bolts as our emblem. We just told the, uh, changed the emblem. Uh, historically, it was red. We made it yellow uh, to reflect the uh, electronic warfare, cyber, uh, lightning bolts. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we're really excited about our name, uh, really excited about that heritage and the linkages that we have back to that World War II uh, era. So what do we do here at the National Training Center? So uh, what we do is we we train up to 10 brigade combat teams per year. So we're talking uh, order of magnitude of 4,500 soldiers, 1,700 vehicles uh, that come here for uh, to train in our, uh, our training area. So we have uh, just over 1,200 square miles that we can train at. Uh, that's give, give or take the size of Rhode Island. Um, we have a world-class free-thinking opposition force, the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, um, which have near-peer capabilities like small EOSs, space uh, ISR capabilities, electronic warfare capabilities. They have an information warfare section, which is looking to you know, attack, uh, use informational fires against the, the brigades that come here. Uh, we have the airspace up to 29,000 feet. 
uh, 12 urban centers, uh, and we have a contested electromagnetic spectrum, and we operate it in a denied, degraded, and disrupted space operating environment. So, uh, with GPS, uh, is 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 disrupted here. So we're throwing everything that we can uh, at the brigade uh, as we see uh, the challenges that they would face in large-scale combat operations, mm -hmm. um, and, and we increase the uh, the pressure. We we have that Rio stat where we can uh, we can help them meet their training objectives while testing them in, in multiple forms of contact. All right. Is is the uh, world class free thinking op for operating force that you're that you described is that a um, virtual force or is it like boots on the ground there you you've got you've got people that are permanently stationed that are the uh, uh, red team I guess yeah so uh, the eleventh armored cavalry regiment ah is, okay uh, two yeah you two squadrons for battalion size elements. Uh, that uh, they have some visually modified vehicles that uh, that look like uh, Russian vehicles, and they go out there and uh, we play essentially a giant game of laser tag using the miles uh, system. Um, and for about nine, ten days, uh, we take the gloves off and let them uh, let them duke it out uh, using terrain uh, and. Precision fires, uh, indirect fires, all that stuff uh, is in play uh, to really challenge that brigade and, and the closest thing uh, that they'll ever get to the combat um, short of actual combat. So we're training, uh, training them to win the first battle of the next war. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Do any of your exercises include uh, uh, joint forces or even combined forces with uh, 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 U.S. allies or anything like Absolutely. that? Absolutely. So uh, the uh, Rock Army often comes. We see British, Australian, um, usually at least half of our rotations out here have uh, some sort of multinational flavor to them. Maybe, Brian, you can like walk the audience through the kind of thing that a army brigade might expect, right? So I'm I'm a I'm I'm part of a brigade uh, and I'm I'm getting ready to deploy to Fort Irwin for this this training exercise. Um, what are the kinds of things that 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 these uh, soldiers and, and and other service members are going to experience? Yeah, first of all, they're going to go through an expeditionary RSOI, reception staging, onward integration. So uh, previously, uh, brigades would come here, they'd kind of hang out on Fort Irwin. Now they go straight out to essentially a FOB, uh, Fort Operating operating Base, to build their combat power in an austere environment uh, and, and get ready to, to conduct combat operations. So we're focusing on large-scale combat operations here. So uh, the brigade combat team, usually an armor brigade or striker brigade, they come out here uh, uh, and they put their their war face on, and they go straight out uh, to to do that uh, direct fire, indirect fire engagements uh, with our uh, world class op four. Um, so they have they have a certain period where they're uh, you know they receive all their equipment, unpack their containers, and, and combat uh, load their vehicles. To get ready to go, um, and then once they're out there, um, they're you know they're being engaged, uh, they're being uh, observed pretty much at all times uh, by the op four. Um, we're also uh, there are live EW effects. Um, they're being jammed, uh, so they have to really work on their pace plan for communication. So the primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency plan, uh, how they're going to communication. Uh, how they're going to talk uh, with their communications equipment. Because honestly, uh, if they rely on one system, we're going to jam it, and they're not going to be able to talk. So they have to have those contingencies uh, in place before they can get here. Uh, again, we talked about uh, GPS disruption. Uh, 
they cannot rely on their, their, their daggers, their GPS receivers. They have to be able to uh, use terrain association and go analog when necessary uh, in order to, to, to get after it because they can't expect to be operating uh, with GPS full and clear uh, against a near peer adversary. Um, we also have uh, a synthetic internet and social media network that uh, they use through a closed cellular network so they can get on a, a, one of our cell phones and they can serve Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and some of it is you know, just white noise. Some of it is going to be uh, someone inside of a town posting pictures of, you know, what the what the adversary is doing, and much like what we see uh, in Ukraine, where you know open source intelligence or publicly available information is just a huge enabler to help determine battle damage assessments and gather those atmospherics of what's going on on the ground and help enable targeting. Um, we we have a media. Uh, we have a, uh, essentially a uh, CNN, uh, Fox News equivalent, the International News Network that does live broadcasts uh, and uh, news media shows, as well as print media. We have civilian role players out there. So they're going to get to interact with the, the U.S. Uh, Department of State country team uh, that are all role players here. Uh, they're going to have to interact with their host nation partners, you know, the provincial governors, the police chief, uh, all the way down uh, to the mayors and the population that are in some of these towns. So they're going to be challenged uh, across, you know, from an adversary perspective, a non-hostile perspective, and you know, just the local people who are just trying to make ends meet and uh, find their next meal. Uh, and, and make sure that they get uh, supplies and get their basic necessities met. Um, so they're going to be they're going to be challenged in multiple directions uh, that they're not that, that these brigades just can't get at their home station when they're doing their training. And we're also trying to relearn some 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 things. Uh, counterinsurgency. Uh, there's lots of uh, lots of stuff that we learned that is great. It also helped us build some false assumptions. And so uh, we're challenging those assumptions here. Uh, you know, like uh, a deployment is not going to be uh, completely uncontested. It's probably from the time they leave their home station, uh, they're going to be in contact as their, their equipment is on ships heading to where it needs to be. As they arrive, they're going to be under constant observation. Um, so that whole deployment is is uh, is key. The speed in their tempo of our forces and the way, ways that they, the means that they make contact, or you know, our adversaries potentially are going to know exactly what they where they are and what they're what they're doing because of small UASs and space based ISR is is tipping them off before they even get to the point of contact. So we really try and train that uh, the brigades come here to combine arms, you know, combining infantry, you know, tanks, artillery, uh, in, in some of those air assets like A-10s, which come in on a regular basis, you know, uh, how to fight in that close fight. But we got to figure out how do we, how do we combine arms in the information environment as well? Uh, how, do, how do they continue to uh, uh, to maintain relevancy in the information environment, because you can win the battle and lose the war, and that strategic corporal is still very, very important. You know that that person on the ground who's interacting with the local population, uh, because uh, we can see, uh, uh, you know. All it takes is a cell phone for something to be mm -hmm. uh, in the in the universe, you know, in the, in the global media market uh, within within minutes, uh, and those kind of missteps will, will certainly resonate uh, and cause challenges. Also, uh, 
So brigades may not have some of the organic staff to consider some of these multi-domain effects. Um, so there'll be cyber forces, there'll be space forces, you know, all these all these guys that are, are higher echelons, echelons above brigades, they're going to be brought into a large-scale combat operation. Um, and the brigade may not uh, have the planners to, to really synchronize to plan out some of those effects, but there will be higher echelons that do. And so brigades must be cognizant of those multi-domain effects mm. that are going to be in play, that are going to give them uh, that relative advantage uh, for in time and space to achieve their objectives. And if they they blow that, you know, those are going to be uh, limited in windows probably um, and can only do it so many times before the adversary figures it out. So if the brigade doesn't take advantage of those windows, uh, then they're going to lose out. So they must consider those information. Mm. Well, my goodness, you, you, you said a lot there. Uh, one, one thing I just want to mention, real quick. so you, you mentioned OSINT and publicly available information and that you guys bring that kind of a dynamic into this uh, exercise. And, and just, just this week, actually, uh, uh, I suggest our listeners check out uh, our most recent episode, which is all about OSINT. And so if you want a little bit of a deeper dive into OSINT, check that out with uh, Dr. Elliot Jardines. Uh, that's number one. But uh, number two, um, my goodness. Uh, so you guys have really created this immersive uh, experience, which, you know, you have people people come on to, on the ground to have this exercise but it's almost <laughs> there's a there's a movie I, I i i can't put put my put my uh, uh finger on it but there's a movie that comes to mind where the uh people in the movie kind of like unknowingly they 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 enter into this world where everything is is kind of prearranged and it, it it kind of sounds like that, you know. It, it's not, but but it's also really flexible, right? So it's like you have all this infrastructure in place to uh, try to simulate what a brigade or a combat force is likely to experience uh, in today's real world. And you guys have really thought it through. And did did I get this right? Where you said that you not only have a robust, like you know, human Red Force, uh, which is engaging, but you also have like like an augmenting like blue higher headquarters, which 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 the the exercise brigade should should uh, also leverage those capabilities that that the higher headquarters brings. So it would would you say that that's right? Absolutely. Uh, so we'll replicate 52nd Infantry Division, or sometimes Seventh uh, Corps, depending on who's here. Um, but we replicate those higher level uh, echelons. Uh, the commander of our operations group, uh, during the scenario, he'll often role play as a deputy commander um, to give that direction and guidance and, and steerage to that brigade to help them. Because ultimately, we're, we're here to help them uh, improve themselves, test out their, uh, test out their TTPs, uh, and build, the, build their staffs and organizations. And, you know, a really challenging environment. But at, at the end of the day, we're helping them meet their training objectives. So sometimes we have to be really dynamic and shift uh, what we're planning on doing or increase that rheostat. Uh, if they're doing really well, then we take the gloves off. Uh, if their comms are, or if they're challenged on their comms, we'll often take a step back, uh, help do some hard coaching to get them uh, back right. Uh, and then, uh, and then hit them again, uh, and, and jam their their ability to talk. Uh, so yeah, it's all a giant balancing act of of where they are at any given point of what we're what we're going to hit them with. Mm. Wow, that is awesome. Uh, are you aware, Brian, of any other uh, training capabilities which are similar to this, either within the U.S. Department of Defense or with with any of our friends and allies? Any, any kind of a similar capability out there? 
So certainly the Joint uh, Readiness Training Center at Fort Polk, Louisiana, um, they typically take care of the, uh, the airborne and the, the light infantry uh, while we take care of striker and armor brigades just because we have the maneuver space, uh, uh, just slightly different terrain. That, and, and so we focus you know, on the heavy guys, they focus on the light guys. There's the JMRC out of Germany that does that with their multinational partners uh, and US forces uh, out in Germany. Um, and uh, I'd be remiss to, but I, I think uh, I'm, I'm unaware of a lot of uh, our uh, international like training centers, uh, but we yeah. we put in a lot. Fort Irwin is here to train brigade combat teams. That is our purpose, and um, we are here to help them win that first battle of the next war. Are you guys requested to go out to other? large exercises like uh i don't know for example like like purple star or what what is the one in in korea like Co cobra gold right these these big multinational operations are you know experts from the ghost team right are 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 experts from the ghost team requested to go out to these other exercises to to play some kind of like an advisory role or perhaps to you know gather lessons learned i i can imagine that this, this is a long convoluted question i can imagine that there would be a very strong demand signal to be able to like copy paste your capability but into other uh exercise dynamics you do you kind of get what i'm asking absolutely so uh Back in October, we did go out to uh, JPMRC, the Joint Pacific. I'm going to butcher your acronym, but it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there will not be a test. Uh, but out in Hawaii, we sent our OCs out to, to Hawaii uh, for this multinational exercise out there. Uh, we don't we don't go like overseas to, for Cobra Gold or anything like that. But uh, there is some active collaboration between us. And some of our, uh, you know, JRTC and JMRC, uh, we we talk and share TTPs. Uh, currently, we're the only ones that have consolidated uh, all these capabilities under a single team, uh, and we're seeing huge dividends come of it because we're able to holistically challenge the brigade combat team in the information environment, um, whereas. Uh, it, and we can look left and right and figure out, well, what effects are we trying to achieve here? And how how do we want to force them to work together and collaborate uh, and add those injects to make them uh, consider the information line and how to really combine arms uh, in the information line? Well, so, Brian, so how, how do you perceive the National Training Center and the ghost team evolving to meet the ever-changing requirements of today's multi-domain operations? Absolutely. And uh, our commanding general, General Taylor, often looks uh, at ghost team that how, how do we evolve to meet the challenges for multi-domain operations, which is, I think, a major fundamental shift in the way you know, it's the Army operating concept. Is we went, you know, from uh, multiple iterations of uh, different operating concepts to now realizing that good enough isn't good enough. Uh, we can be the best tank uh, uh, drivers. We can we can outshoot our adversary, but that's not going to mean a a single thing if our tanks are destroyed by long range precision fires you know, 20 kilometers away from the forward line of troops. Um, you know, so if we don't account for multi-domain operations, then uh, our forces are going to be attrited before they even make contact uh, with our with our adversaries. So we got to give them that chance to do that voodoo that they do so well. So what we're doing here uh, is uh, there's a lot of efforts, both this allow brigades to see what they look like in the electromagnetic spectrum. You know, that's, that's been an information gap, you know, how, showing them exactly how loud they are 
at and the EMS has been uh, really interesting and eye-opening for both, both sort of some of our senior leaders and, and for the brigade themselves because we've operated un, under the auspices where it's okay to turn my FM radio on power amp, which is the highest power setting, uh, because no one's really contesting us. Uh, you know, our counter IED systems basically emitted large amounts of uh, energy uh, and is uh, detectable by our adversaries. So we have to consider consider that as it, as it, we're moving moving ahead. We have to consider what the space and and cyber play uh, in large scale combat operations and practice it. So it's not a pickup game during that first battle of the next war. You know, that's that's the challenge with the United States Army and the military in general is, uh, like you look in at World War II, uh, first battle, uh, we took it on the on the chin. You know, we we didn't we had to learn some hard lessons uh, early on in, in the war so that we could adapt and uh, eventually win. You know. But we don't have time to, to lose that first battle of the next war. You know, we must win it because that battle, that war may not last for very long between political uh, considerations uh, and just the ability to mass uh, mass effects in certain areas. Uh, you know, the war might be over before ground forces uh, get into the battle. Um, so we, we, we have to consider all, all that stuff, uh, being under constant observation at all times. Uh, and unless we were kid at the National Training Center, we're going to teach our soldiers bad lessons. Uh, and so when they go to go into real combat, you know, cell phones scare, the, scare me. Like we've seen in uh, Ukraine where, you know, Soldiers taking videos and posting them to the internet results on, you know, artillery fire, you know, because you can use, as long as you have enough distinguishable uh, terrain features or, you know, street address or something like that, uh, you can figure out pretty easily with Google Maps or any other commercial software, you can figure out where, where the, exactly they are. Mm. Uh, uh, there was a recent article about uh, that I watched on YouTube about a, a Russian soldier posting stuff on VK talking about him going out on a mission and showing his truck and showing his barracks uh, in a video. And then the next video is him showing the aftermath of HIMARS raining down on his barracks uh, and the devastation that was uh, that was caused. And yeah, you what, know, uh, uh, back to that. Uh, episode I mentioned just a moment ago, the the OSINT and uh, leveraging publicly available information uh, in in close to real time. I I think um, Elliot Jardines brought up either that exact same example or a very similar example of of um, uh, damage footage or damage video being posted online and the Ukrainians being able to um, use that for battle damage assessment and, and whether or not they were successful or not. And if they weren't successful, hit it again because, hey, you know, mission mission not accomplished yet. So yeah, uh, amazing. And, uh, this and, time and more importantly, they use it for influence. They're very good at, they're, the Ukrainians have been very media savvy so that, you know, uh, I mean, heck, I'm guilty of it. Uh, that, that uh, you know, any time I see a anti tank guided missile attack that the Ukrainians do against Russians, I'm drawn into that. That's that's imagery that I I'm interested whether or not I really want to be or not at that time. Uh, I'll I'll still watch it because it's it's fascinating and it and it shares a narrative that. The Ukrainians are the underdogs, and they're winning with the help of the Western munitions, which, of course, they are. But uh, it's helping their their influence campaign as well by by showing that imagery. Uh, like there was a, there was a great video of a small U it was little drone uh, uh, racing drones uh, that.
had a you know so, small munition mounted to it, and it going a hundred some odd miles an hour uh, right into the back of a BDRM, uh, and that imagery goes right until and then ceases you know at at the point of in, uh, of impact, you know it's that's that's great multimedia imagery to help out their their uh, narrative. Mm, yeah, that's astonishing. Uh, there is there is an, a, another uh, topic that I I want to have a, a podcast episode on, but I haven't found the right person yet to discuss it. But there is a concept uh, that is called the law of requisite variety, and it's 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 a complex systems term, but what it essentially says is that um, in order for uh, people to manage a complex system effectively is you have to have the appropriate toolkit of variety to be able to respond to the to the ever-evolving variety of of uh, attacks or engagements that you're experiencing. So if, if you could just do the mental you know, thought experiment, the, the, the variety of, act, of uh, combat engagement activities, which were uh, present say during World War II or Vietnam uh, were much smaller than the variety of, of engagement activities that, that you and your colleagues are, are trying to teach you know these uh, these brigades, right? But the the variety of potential activities is huge. I mean, you're talking about being able to grapple with space related stuff, cyber related stuff, uh, social me media related stuff, uh, converting publicly available information into OSINT, and probably another dozen things which were just not even on on the the mental plate of things to grapple with you know even 20 or 40 years ago but that makes it really hard the the more variety that you have to deal with the harder it is and you you are living that problem set right now absolutely and, and the one thing I'll, I'll throw out there is you know when we look at civil affairs forces that come out here and they're doing their civil information engagement, and, you know, engaging with local mayors and all that stuff. There's so much uh, that can be accomplished, or so much of that can be accomplished through cyber reconnaissance. Uh, you know, every chamber of commerce out there has a website, and they talk about who the mayor is and all, all the key leaders. You know, so when we're talking about civil information from a from a civil affairs or a psychological operations perspective, that information is out there. It's on cyber, in cyberspace. You just got to be able to go out and find it. When we look at a reconnaissance squadron that is, you know, screening along the forward line of troops, looking for where the the adversary is, you know, what's to say that you know, in five, ten years, a portion of them are back, essentially even in sanctuary. Just searching social media, looking for publicly available information, uh, or all the other sources of, of uh, available information, in order to to find and close with our adversaries, uh, mm -hmm. and, and provide, you know, depending on the sophistication, the metadata of where images were taken, taken, or doing that train association of well, this picture was taken within, you know. 500 meters of this location. Uh, so therefore, they're probably here. So I can tip and cue with another asset to confirm whether that those guys are there. Uh, you know, cyberspace offers so many potential opportunities to enhance reconnaissance. Mm. Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, that, that whole publicly available information and converting it into OSINT uh, and l leveraging the various data stores which are out there uh, and to, to be able to convert that into open source intelligence is just vast. And we are only limited by our, by well, I, I think we're limited by both manpower and 
um, our imaginations as to how to how to harness the insights which are available within publicly available information. And uh, I keep going back to the previous uh, episode, yep, but um, I, I uh, you know, uh, Elliot Jardines, who's an expert in OSINT, uh, he, he agrees that uh, uh, China is um, ahead of of us when it comes to that 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 capability of of converting available information into intelligence and they've definitely got the upper hand when it comes to manpower um i mean they've got a lot of people um and i i heard this somewhere this this might be urban legend but it's at least directionally accurate it's something like you know china is is producing something like a million PhDs each year, every year a million PhDs. You know, and you know runs runs the gamut right from social science all the way to, you know, I don't know veterinary medicine and everything in between, right? But yeah, I mean China could could literally put like a tiger team of people, like three to four people, like a in 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 marine speak, like a. A, a fire team of people on every single like startup business in in, in the western world it's like you, okay okay guys and gals your your job is to mine every little kernel of information that you can from what this small business is doing or you, you mentioned chambers of commerce yeah your your job is to understand everything that you can about uh des moines iowa right and then they've got another one for you know all the small towns in america or you know large and small towns in america and you know your, your job is to convert publicly available information about this 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 Ge geography into open source intelligence and, and and have like a team of people to do that and cover the globe. John, what I would say is, uh, I mean, this is an opportunity if there's any researchers out there is, you know, with all this data available, uh, how is it making, helping the commander win? Hmm. You know, that that's the biggest challenge that we see is there's, there's lots of data out there, but if we cannot uh, take that data uh, consolidate it, get it into a usable format in which helps the commander gain situational understanding and helps them make decisions to help them win, then we're not doing uh, doing those commanders any favors. But yeah. with this massive amount of data, so when we're talking about artificial intelligence, when we're talking about machine learning, you know, there's a lot of cool capabilities out there. But unless it's helping someone win and make a decision to get relative advantage at, in time and space, then uh, we really need to focus on you know how how we do that. You know, just because we can do something cool doesn't mean we should do something cool if it has no tangible output uh, that I can, I can leverage. Totally agree, and I, I think this gets also into the concept of uh, knowledge management as well. Absolutely. Uh, another another topic that I'd like to discuss with somebody on the podcast. Brian, I always like to try to close out and ask the guest if they can suggest a book or an online resource that uh, our audience might appreciate. Do you have something in mind? Uh, I actually have two. Uh, one, if uh, so, uh, Stratagem with Deception and Surprise and War by Barton Whaley. That's an old oldie but a goodie. Um, where I think that's the most important is uh, inside that book, it has uh, one, one of the tables that, that I think is really, really powerful uh, and is very important for our practice, practitioners of mil, uh, tactical deception, you know, and, you know, our army formations. Uh, they surveyed 122 use cases uh, from history, and they came up with casualty rates. When you when you, based on these 122 cases, when you did not have surprise and did not have deception, your casualty rate for every one that we lost, we killed or wounded 1.1 of theirs. When you add in surprise and deception, those rates skyrocketed. For every one that we lost, we inflicted 6.3 casualties on our adversaries. This is historical documentation. Like, so I think it's really important uh for you know it's a little bit of a lost art and military professionals you know on how we do tactical deception 
and really how do we do tactical exceptions in a multi-domain environment, uh, which is under con near constant observation and under enemy contact at pretty much all times. So that's one. The other one that I'm reading right now, and granted I'm not finished, so I can't give a full recommendation, but Alchemy by Rory Sutherland, uh, which really talks about, uh, so he's a marketing guy, and he's talk talking about how sometimes we lie to ourselves. Uh, and what we say is important to us isn't always what is important to us and isn't what resonates with us. So when you're talking about influence, sometimes it's the intangible things that are, uh, that are, uh, that don't necessarily conform with modern military thinking, uh, that, that really are, are that magic sauce for, for our operations. Like it, as an example in Afghanistan, uh, when we were dropping leaflets, they would often, you know, focus on, you know, uh, you know how we're, we're beating up on our adversary or whatever, you know, signs of strength. When in Afghan culture, like having a floral background and like picture with a flower, like that's what sells. That's, that's the cool guy picture, you know, you know, and we completely miss the ball on in some opportunities, uh, just because, you know, a commander might look at a picture and be like, that's not cool enough. We need to make it more hardcore. Um, so Alchemy by Rory Sutherland, I think is the other one uh, that I would recommend. All right. Excellent suggestions. And uh, wow. With that, Brian Burbank, thank you so much for being a guest on the Cognitive Crucible. Thank you, John. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.